This is the third Heaven Traveler, Andrew Sheets, with you. This blog is about the spiritual life of Jesus Christ in us who believe on him and applying this existence to our physical world. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, King James Bible. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. John chapter 14, verse 9. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you with the deepest burden on my heart that the many, many out there that are not reading their Bible, especially the final authority of the King James Bible, but they're reading and using their perverted Bible translations and following after their false teachers, apostate and heretical pastors and teachers who've come out of apostate seminaries. Lord, I pray that the ones and twos out there, and you know who they are, will read and watch and listen to this study and learn from this. And Lord, that they may come out from among them, Lord. May eyes be opened. I pray, I pray that you'd honor and bless this work for your glory forever. Hallelujah. Even so, come soon, dear Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> this study, as I said, is he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. As also in all his epistles, and Peter is talking about the Apostle Paul, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. That means they wrestle with these epistles of Paul, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. This should strike terror into any listener who is uncertain in their knowledge and their understanding of God's word. Any time you, listener, are using a perverted Bible and studying God's word, you right there and alone are on dangerous ground. Make no mistakes. All Bible translations are not God's word. They have been perverted. We have it in our studies. And many false teachers, I came out of one of those churches where the pastor was saying, oh, Paul was too difficult to understand. Even Peter said so. Let's stick with just the four gospels. If it's red letter, that's good for us. All scripture is given by inspiration of God in, in 2 Timothy 3.16. We have to study but those who are not, uh, who are unlearned, that means willfully ignorant, they don't want to learn, they wrestle with these things. And they wrestle with all scriptures for their own destruction. Compare this with 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study. Study is hard work. I have this in another blog. Read about how to study and why study is hard work. To show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All scripture in this study is in the King James Bible. Why the King James Bible? Only read and study the links. Which church do you belong to, listener? The church in Philadelphia of Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, which the false teacher, hyper-dispensationalists, say the church is not in the book of Revelation. Or the church of the Laodiceans, the apostate church in this age, in Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 19. Study what the apostate church operations of today looks like. This work presented here today is a joint labor of love by Andrew Sheets, Rick Whitaker, and his wife, Lena Whitaker. Brother Whitaker, special thanks for this title of this study and you, and, and correction, and you and your lovely wife and my sister Lena's in-depth assistance in research and collaboration to produce this work. This is the most 
comprehensive, the most profoundly researched work that I have ever put together since I've been doing this for the past 12 or so years. I've witnessed how God's hand is and works in the body of Christ, a group of believers, the unity and love and, and love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The more we study, the more we find out who Jesus is. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. And if you truly know Jesus, you truly know who he is and that you know he is God 100%. Introduction. Jesus Christ, 100% not human. This may shock you to the core, listener. Continue with us. The purpose of this study is to address the prevalent and overwhelming amount of false teaching and its demonic influence that diminishes Jesus Christ alone as the one true God Almighty, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Amen. This is done by man's philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. This is done by man's carnal mind, which is enmity against God. Read Romans chapter 8, verse 7. In their carnally vain imagination's description of Jesus Christ as the second person of the Trinity, or now we find these reprobates mutating like a virus and now say that they won't even say the second person of the Trinity. They say the second person of the Godhead. And, and we see them go from God as three gods in one God to God is one God in three persons. We even found teaching that denies the Trinity, but declares the Godhead is really two beings, the Father and the Son. As always, they show the Son as being subordinate to his Father, and see uh, the Godhead versus Trinity teaching in the links below to understand. And Jesus Christ, uh, see this to understand that Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Only one body, only one person, only one being. There's only one. God Almighty is one, and that is Jesus Christ. The study is so in-depth. If you go into the link and if you've watched this video and followed my videos and our studies, you'll see clearly God the Father is spirit. No man is seen. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. There's not an old man sitting there on a throne in heaven saying, come and hold my hand, little boy. I'm scrolling down many pages into this study. Look at this picture again. If you haven't seen my uh, uh, studies on this and our studies working together, notice that in this picture, if you can see this on the screen, this is how the Trinitarians depict Jesus Christ, a subservient second person bowing to the old man wearing the many crowns. See the Pope so many crowns exactly as the Pope's in the shape of his mitre is and pointing at his right hand here, boy, sit in the sit here, little boy, come and sit in your throne. This is not even close to scripture. This is not scripture people. There's been other teachers that changed the definition of person to me <clears throat> to not mean what the Oxford English Dictionary defines as person. I'm not making this up. They literally say the word person means something else when it's in referring to the Godhead. No, person is written and means person. 
the definition clearly defines it. See our study. Then they cherry pick scriptures to fit their false narrative using what a perverted Bible translation. Going hand in hand with their pagan trinity concept, they squawk like parrots that Jesus never existed until he was born as a human and his existence was 100% human, fully human, human nature. And then they have the audacity to say that although he was 100% human as we are, he was also 100% God. 100% God, yes, amen. 100% human, liars. This war has been raging since the last apostles. Jesus and all the apostles warned that wolves would soon follow. See in notes below how the council of Chalcedon created the new doctrine. It's not even remotely listed, written in the King James Bible. Understand this. The King James Bible does not say such things. The King James Bible says we are of the first Adam born into sin. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Psalms chapter 51 verse 5. Jesus Christ clearly was not born into sin, but rather he is the last Adam. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20. You see, Jesus Christ is God. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Read it for yourself, John chapter 8, 58. Either the Bible lies or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21 is the truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If Jesus Christ was born fully human, then he had man's DNA and was of the first Adam. But yet he knew no sin. We're born into sin as the first Adam. There's false teachers saying that Jesus was the second Adam. We'll see further in the study and Bibles, perverted Bibles say that. But, if he was born into sin, he was of the first Adam. This cannot harmonize with Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, chapter 5, 7, and 8. However, what scripture does say, Jesus Christ was charged with our sins. It was in, Our sins were imputed upon him when he was on the cross that's when he cried out my god why hast thou forsaken me he's not talking to another god he's talking to his father he's talking to his spirit of within him isaiah 53 verse 6 read the scriptures first peter chapter 2 verse 4 matthew 27 verse 46 Luke 24, 44, Luke 15, 16, 18, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Matthew 22, 34. Also, take the time and read Galatians chapter 20, verse 20, chapter 3, verse 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 22, 23. Jesus did not refer to Joseph as his father, as perverted Bibles say. Compare, like for example, the NIV with the KJV. Read Luke chapter 2. Either the Bible lies or Philippians chapter 2, 7 and 8 and Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 is true. Philippians chapter 2, 7 and 8 reads, but made himself of no reputation. That does not say he emptied himself, we're going to discuss later, and took upon him the form of a servant, and watch, was made in the likeness of men. To be made in the likeness does not mean he was born as a man, born as man. No, made in the likeness of, and we'll describe later what we mean by that, and being found in fashion as 
found in fashion as does not say he was made or he was created as a man. No, huge difference. Hebrews chapter 217, and behooved him to be made like, not as, but like unto his brethren. What is a human being? The word human comes from the Latin word humus, meaning earth or ground. Does this ring a bell? We were created from dirt. We know scripture's clear there. If one wants to incorrectly say Jesus is 100% human, then the mere definition cannot be supported by scripture because Adam, the first Adam, came from dust, dirt, soil. Jesus did not come from dust, dirt, or soil, or of the DNA of dust, dirt, soil, born into sin. No, <clears throat> Jesus came from heaven. Jesus Christ came from heaven, not from the dirt and soil of his father, of the DNA of Joseph, which was of the first Adam. Read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 45. Also, every seed after its own kind, study this, every seed after its own kind. In Genesis 1, 11, read it. In Genesis chapter 1, 20, the King James Bible is the only Bible translation that uses the word begotten, which literally means Jesus is God by God's DNA, meaning his very structure, he is God. Read the study here. To be God, we have the scripture and biology is given thoroughly. And this is explained in detail by Dr. John Hinton in the only begotten in John 3.16. It's in the link description block of the blog read it, study it, it would take another <clears throat> half an hour to an hour to explain this link, read it and study it. And if you read John 3.16 of begotten and understand what begotten, only begotten means, and you harmonize that with Matthew chapter 1 verse 16, we see the word begotten of man in every generation and then when we come to verse 16, something happens. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Jesus was not begotten of man. However, in John 3, 16, we clearly see that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Here's a perfect example. Recently, I had a YouTube reader insist that Jesus was created as fully human when he was born of the Virgin by the Holy Spirit, by God's direction. This carnal, foolish logic continues that Jesus existed as a human being, 100% human. And though they admit, they'll say it, they'll say, yes, he's fully God, but they continue to say that he never existed before that time. How can God never exist until he is born of the virgin? How can God create, make, create another being who's another God? Do you see a problem with this? That's pagan. <coughs> it's heretical. It's blasphemous. Bible commentary after Bible commentary makes the same statements over and over again that the YouTuber above makes. However, God's word is clear and states otherwise. Read Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I am the Lord and beside me there is no savior. I'm asking you, listener, as we do this study, go through it with your Bible, pause the video, write your notes, read your King James Bible. And sure, look at what the, the other Bible versions say when we show you for yourself, do it for yourself. 
In all of our studies, we want the reader to read and study for themselves. Don't take what we say as final. Take what we say. Take it to your Bible. Be a good Berean. Search the scriptures for yourself. And right now, I'm asking you to go to your Bible. Open your Bible right now to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11. When, when you are, when you are at this verse, Isaiah chapter 43, 11, read with me, please. Very deliberately, slowly, and meditate upon his word. King James, Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. This was written several hundred years before Jesus Christ by the prophet Isaiah. This is God Almighty speaking. This is Jesus Christ incarnate. This is Him, as they say incarnate. I don't even want to say this is Jesus Christ in the flesh standing before us, not is fully human, but himself in, 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 in a body standing before us in his flesh. Open uh, to the next scripture where in Isaiah, go back to chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Can we read this again? John chapter 8, 58. Before Abraham was, I am. Wait a minute. This, these very words, I am that I am. The burning bush, Jesus Christ was manifesting through the burning bush, speaking to Moses. And now the same God who is Jesus Christ and stand right now. Open your Bibles, please, to Colossians. Uh, The Lord put this on my heart right now. Stop. This is not even script here. Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians 1, 15. Who, this is Jesus Christ, is the image of the visible God, the firstborn of every creature. This is Jesus Christ, people. This is him himself, God Almighty. He's God in he's God in in a body standing before us. He's telling the Pharisees in John 8 58, before Abraham was, I am. And you can go to John chapter 12, 45. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. Are you reading that? Do you understand what that says, listener? And our title of this whole study, John chapter 14, verse 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. It can't be clear. If you are not seeing this, pray that God open your eyes. 
God is Jesus Christ. The Father is spirit residing in existence and being in Jesus Christ. There's only one God, and that is Jesus Christ we see standing before us. Isaiah 43, 10 says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. This is God speaking through the prophet. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So how could God Almighty make another little God in Mary's womb that cannot be harmonized with Isaiah 43.10? Neither shall there be after me. There's only one God. This battle of false teachers teaching what is not in Scripture has been raging for 1,700 years. Just as the pagan Trinity philosophy was injected and adopted by the Vatican in 325, so has this notion of Jesus being completely human and was made doctrine by the Council of Chalcedon. See the notes below. Come in the flesh. We people, believers, I will say believers as I and Brother Ricky and Sister Lena and the other believers who know this, we're called heretics because they say, oh, John, 2 John 1 7 says that for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. God forbid we would not confess that Jesus Christ did, is not is come in the flesh. We would never, never not confess confess this. Yes, Jesus Christ did come in the flesh as a body with skin, with eyes, with the hair, blood flowed out of him. He was born through the birth canal by water and blood of a woman, a vir the virgin, the virgin. What we're saying is in the flesh, and we're going to prove it, does not mean fully human. What God's saying here is, here I am. I am God, I'm with you in the flesh, his flesh, his form, the visible image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. We know in Genesis 1.26 that we're created in his image. We have nose, ears, eyes, hair, feet. So does he. But it's his flesh, not ours. This is not referring to the biological tissue of flesh excuse me, we have when we're born into sin of first Adam. He is the last Adam. In the Council of Constantinople in AD 381, this was a hot, heated debate, and they came out and rejected the teachings of, Apo of Apollinaris, who said that Jesus' divine nature displaced his human mind and will. And uh, according to Apollonaris, Jesus was not fully human. And they used 2 John 1, 7 to, to go after him. And we this is discussed at length and got questions. Link, that's not above here, but it's down in the, uh, down below inside of our notes. Got questions, discusses this whole thing. But we want to focus that, that um, when this scripture... In 2 John 1, 7, in the flesh, when this is seen as an idiom, God is truly saying to us, Look, I am stands among you. Behold, it is I. And we see 2 John 1, 7, and to say God took on human nature is heresy from man's ignorance. No, he took on his own nature, his own form, and manifested himself in his own flesh. And people tend to forget that it is us that are made in his image and after his likeness and not the other way around. The word incarnate has been completely taken out of context in the translation that is not according to scripture. God cannot be human in any way or he would not be 100% God. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Let's look at this thoroughly. 
in 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Amen. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and now already is in this world. In 2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Stop here. What they've done is taking in the flesh, and instead of describing what Jesus Christ is saying, what the Word of God is saying here, they're taking flesh to mean 100% human born into sin flesh. But we are going to break this down. Whenever Jesus Christ, who is God, is written in Scripture, the verb to be is used to describe him. Before Abraham was, I am, like John 8, 58. In Revelation chapter 4, 8, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. It's not surprising that the verb to be is used to describe Jesus Christ as the as he appeared to man as the babe in the manger. In the Oxford English Hard Copy Dictionary, page 146, we see that to be is used as a verb, an intransitive verb, and which is not for passive voice, but rather it's used as an auxiliary verb. And if we go to 14b, it says to express the condition or state now attained rather than reaching it. For example, the sun is set. The sun exists. It, it, it's not just appearing all of a sudden out of nowhere. No, it is in its condition as set. So if we, on page 473, we see the verb to be used as an auxiliary verb. It means to express the resulting state. So let's break this down. Go slowly with me. If you have to stop, pause the video, take notes. Is come. Using the present indicative of the verb to be in the third person as an auxiliary with the verb come. So all that uh, lingo in grammar and speaking of English grammar, all that saying is we're using the verb to be in the third person is is. And we're using this verb is here as an auxiliary verb, a helping verb next to the verb come. When this is done, it literally means to present oneself, to bear, to be, to exist. To exist. And in context, eternally appear in the present at the time is used in this context of Scripture. Appearing visible to the world at that moment in time is Jesus, the baby born in the manger. And we go into greater detail if you want to read in our notes. So what am I saying? Let's put this in other words. So when it says that he is come in the flesh, that means the God Almighty Eternal who's existed forever, existing as the body of Jesus Christ, one body, one person, one being manifested himself, brought himself in that point in time in his flesh, his existence. But but you're going to say, but he had skin, like we had skin. He had blood, like we have blood. He sweated tears of blood, it says. He, you can say, he, he when they were uh, whipping him and lashing him with the cat of nine tails and putting the crown of thorns on him, he suffered. Paul... Uh, correction, uh, <clears throat> the apostle Thomas even had to put his hand in the side. He saw, wow, this is really, you really are Jesus Christ that we saw hanging on the cross. Yes, he was in the form and fashion of man. Yes, he felt pain. Yes, he had nerve endings. Yes, he had a circulatory system, obviously. But what we're saying, he was not born into sin as the first Adam. 
the sin was placed on him as fully God in the fashion of man. If you're saying, what does it matter? Or we're talking simple semantics. You say tomato, I say tomato. Human means the same. Okay, he had flesh and blood and bone, so for he's human. But we have to make a strong distinction here. When you say human, you mean exactly as we are 100%. Again, I go back to the fact, if he was us, he could not take on our sins because guess what? It had to be an unblemished lamb. An unblemished lamb means sinless. He was sinless. So how could he be the first Adam? He was the last Adam. And we take the verb is come in the, as, a, as is in the present perfect tense, is come. It literally means in this context, that in coming to us, he presented himself. So he was not born and created from man's DNA, but literally in his own flesh form that was in our fashion says, here I am, I'm here. Example, Matthew chapter 18, verse 11, for the son of man is come to save that which is lost. That means he wasn't created by God as a new little being. Here's a new little Jesus. His name is Jesus. He's a new little God. Holy, he just like man, like you are. No, God Almighty appeared, presented himself and exists, eternally exists, and now brings himself in the present to save that which is lost. Jesus has always existed. And when he was born of the virgin, he stood visible to the world as the son of man. And at that moment in time, as the walking, talking, breathing, savior of the world, amen. Another false narrative is using this new math to convince one that 200% really equals 100%. Liar, liar, pants on fire. These false teachers try to convince us that Jesus was 100% human, 100% God. These fools don't even know it. They're using mutually exclusive terms. And that's impossible. Mutually exclusive for those who do not know what this term means. It's a statistical term. It's describing two or more events that cannot happen simultaneously. It's also an oxymoron. An oxymoron is simply means when you put it together, uh, an oxymoron means a complete contradictory or excuse me, a complete contradiction. Uh, it's a rhetorical device in which two seemingly contradictory words are used together. Now, let me just add this. When you really look at why this is an oxymoron, why the, this is a mutually exclusive language, God gave us a mind and we must apply our mind. The spirit within us bears record of the truth. Our soul, which is our mind, must evaluate and analyze and test. John chapter, in 1 John uh, one, it, it tells us to test all spirits. We're to test the spirits. How do we test things? We have to read it and analyze, logically analyze. God made math. Jesus Christ created all things. Jesus Christ created everything. Math is the language of science and nature about us. There's the law of physics, the law of thermodynamics, the law of gravity. These are undeniable laws that exist and they're written and explained by math and you cannot have 200% as 100%. We find that over 95% of Christians, they comfortably accept and preach and teach Trinity. And, and then we find this retreaded false phrase repeated over and over again. Oh, Jesus Christ is fully God, fully human. He was 100% human, 100% God. And these words are used over and over until they become ingrained in our memory and turned into a habit. 
in studies I found, I lost track 30, 40, 50 high noted uh, scholars and in all the biblical doctrine, human, 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 just like us, exactly like us, born into sin, but he didn't sin. <coughs> These words coming from the, from literally, and we're going to show you from the perverted Bible translations. Incorrect definitions from the Vatican codices, the Vaticanus, Sinaticus, words like incarnate. I even had it slipped out of my mouth when I was doing this teaching. Pre-incarnate, embodied, fully human, 100% human, the second person, the second being, born into sin, became sin, emptied himself. All these scriptures, the church is squawk and squawk and squawk behind the pulpit and the little sheep start squawking the same thing are not scripture. This leaves people in a state of confusion and the need for them to go to the church elders for instruction they receive from the Pope and the Roman Empire. This false teaching also completely permeates the Protestant church of today. There's now no distinction. The word incarnate in the context used by the Trinitarians means second God, second person, second being of the Godhead or Trinity, which is Jesus Christ. The false teaching is of the Trinity and Jesus being fully human is a stronghold. We are at war, folks. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, we're told for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We pray that the ones and twos out there will open their hearts and allow the spirit of God to pull down this stronghold. Amen. We all have to go. Walk back and question what we've never questioned before as we were growing up, just accepting the idea that Jesus was fully human, never doubting what we were told by the ones in authority, these yoke masters. Seeing that the King James Bible doesn't use the word human in reference to Jesus in scripture anywhere and taking it into a more in-depth analysis of the word human and the phrase come in the flesh and understanding what it means to say come in the flesh, including terminology of the pre-incarnate Jesus, Christophany of the New Testament appearance, correction of the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus or the Theophany, which is the Old Testament pre-incarnate appearance of God, right there should tell you they're lost. They're confused. These morons, reprobates, they'll interchangeably say, oh, it was a theophany, that's God. Uh, oh, that was a Jesus uh, in, in the Old Testament. No, there's only one God. Jesus is the image of God. He is God. And there's no pre-incarnate. He's always existed. And we're in the study of come, see, my kinsman, redeemer. It's down here later. We'll show you, we'll go into this. We have proof here that Jesus was not born into sin. He became, or that Jesus became sin, or that Jesus emptied himself. All of these are vain imagination of carnal minds. Here's the proof. Again, we stress. Note the differences from the King James Bible compared to these other versions. Oh, it will shock you. Why a perverted Bible will say he's human, where the King James never says that. Let's do this. We now open uh, with me in the study. Understanding the Son of Man does not mean human as written in Scripture. In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Genesis 1, 26, 27 and Genesis 2, verse 7. Nowhere. In scripture, is it written that God created himself in man's image? 
what scripture does clearly say is that he uh, Jesus Christ was made in the likeness of man being found in the fashion as a man Philippians chapter 2 7 and 8 read it for yourself Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 and it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren it doesn't say and Jesus Christ was made as his brethren or Jesus Christ was created as man no made in the likeness of which we explain later found in the fashion and we're breaking this all down and behooved and liked in two we'll continue there's a distinction seen in scripture when jesus formed himself he manifested himself he brought himself forth from the womb as the son of man let me say it again there's a great distinction as we see in scripture jesus who is god almighty he brought himself through the womb as the son of man through the birth canal of the virgin from the false teaching that Jesus never existed until he existed as the son of man. There's a huge, huge difference. If I'm going to highlight this here in the study, and I'm going to take a few seconds to pause here. I want you, dear listener, to pause, read, meditate on what is said here. Know, make sure that you know, the spirit knows. The mind understands. Make sure that your spirit, with the word of God in hand, and specifically, I want you to hold, open your Bible to Philippians chapter 2, 7, and 8. Go to the study here where it says there's a distinction seen when Jesus formed himself, manifested, brought himself forth from the womb than the false teaching that he never existed until he existed as the son of man. Now, if we are truly honest with ourselves and have adequately studied the aforementioned scriptures, it's obvious that Jesus Christ is eternally existing. I didn't say has eternally existed. I didn't say was. I said is, present tense, the verb to be, existing before Abraham was, I am. And he has existed as the firstborn of every creature. And since Jesus Christ is God and was not created, but he has always existed. And when we see, when we use the word created, when he, go back up to Philippians chapter 2, 7 and 8. When it says that he was made, say that's created, he was made, he was made, he was created, bear with us. In context, it doesn't mean that he was just never, had never been in existence, and then all of a sudden God said, I'm going to make a little Jesus in there. No, God is Jesus. Jesus brought himself through the womb. That's what it means by created in this. When the appointed time came, Jesus Christ literally brought himself the fullness of the Godhead bodily, read Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, into the womb of Mary as an embryo and was born as the Son of Man. There was no conception of himself in the ovum of Mary, her egg, right? but rather in her womb, he had no DNA of man, but of himself as God only. He did not have Joseph's sperm. He was not, <clears throat> excuse me, there, as some have said, the Holy Spirit placed his sperm in Mary's ovum. What? 
The scripture doesn't say that. It says that he brought himself through the womb. When you break it down as we are here, he did not have Mary's DNA. But he was conceived. He was conceived. Bear with us in the study. Remember, God is God. Jesus Christ is God, not of man's DNA, but of himself, God only. Maybe, well, not maybe, it's difficult for our minds to understand the infinite. But the spiritual world, time is far beyond our three-dimensional realm. We'll be repeating this several times here. Jesus Christ con uh, was formed, conceived, and conceived means to be created or formed in the womb in this context. He brought himself as the son of man in the womb of the virgin to be born from the womb of a woman. The word became, which is comes from become, means to be, make, or cause. Come means to happen or to occur. In Matthew 1.20, for the word conceived is G1080 in context means to bring forth. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 120, conceived. But while... He thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee thy wife, to thee, Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That harmonizes perfectly with John 3.16, the only begotten Son of God. That's why the King James has it right. See Dr. Hinton's study. God's DNA. That is, now when it says with the preposition of, in her is of the Holy Ghost, that preposition of meaning means literally God, the Spirit of God, which is God Almighty, is that being that is bringing itself forth through her womb. When examined, the word conceive literally means to introduce sperm seed or sperm into the female egg or ovum. However, we see in context of scripture, further analysis reveals a secondary meaning conceived as described in the Oxford English Dictionary, that it literally means to be formed, bring forth, born from the wound, figuratively to regenerate, bear, beget, bring forth. Look at Emmanuel. God is with us. We know there's no seed, no sperm that was interjected into female egg ovum of Mary because Joseph's sperm was not present. We know that the ovum is the DNA of the child gets from the X and Y, be the Y chromosomes from the mother. God did not have, Jesus Christ did not have Mary's DNA. Why? Because she was also born into sin. She's also of the first Adam. So, when it's conceived in her, we know it's God. We know it can't be her egg. It's going to be her womb. Amen. May eyes be open, Lord. So why would someone make this up and say, well, he's absolute human, exactly like us, although he didn't have our DNA, although he wasn't born and to sin, but he's exact like us. No, he's in a fashion of us. He was literally came with his own being that's existed. Going back to Genesis chapter 126, we're created in his image after his likeness. His image, we have hand, hands, feet, ears, nose, after his likeness. 
we have three parts. We have a body. That's Jesus Christ. We have a spirit. That's God the Father. We have a soul. That's the function of the spirit within us that works, that God breathed in us. It's all in our Godhead versus Trinity teaching. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Likeness of men. That means in this context, feel, yes, he's going to have nerve. He's going to have feelings. Yes, he's going to have emotions. He cried. Yes, he's going to uh, feel like cried, great tears to wet his tears became blood. He cried out, even on the cross, when the Spirit of God put all the sins upon him. He cried out when God, the Father, the Spirit within him, rejected that sin and said, it's all imputed on your body now. It was overwhelming. Breaking down every word. Philippians chapter 2, 6 and 7, made himself form of a servant made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. Let's break it down. Form. When we say in Philippians chapter 2, 6, when we say the form, form means likeness. A body considered in respect to its outward shape and appearance, especially that of a living being or person. That's what I said. When we say fashion, as a man, that means the visible characteristics and appearance. When we say likeness, it means resemblance and shape, form, semblance, copy. One closely resembles. When we say behooved, and it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, as written in Hebrews chapter 217, it literally means that which is required or necessary to be a physical use. So what does that mean? That means that Jesus Christ, it was necessary for him to be physically similar to man so that he could feel the pain, he could bleed blood, he could sweat, sweat, he could uh, perspire, sweat. He could uh, cry tears and made like unto the word unto in the King James Bible literally means Jesus was made to resemble man. I'll repeat this three times. Please stop and pause here. When Jesus said in the King James Bible, unto, made like unto, made like unto his brethren, Hebrews 2.17, this literally means to resemble man. When Jesus says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, made like unto his brethren. It means that he was made to resemble. Don't take my word for it. Go to the hard copy, Oxford English Dictionary, on paragraph 18, page 3550, 3550, I have. It literally means, in this context we're reading here, to resemble. Resemble does not mean is. If I draw a perfect picture of you and say this picture is you, do you realize the absurdity of what these false teachers are saying? Please read the detailed study on Jesus bringing himself forth from the womb. We did a whole study on this. It's called Revealing More of the Lamb Who Was Slain. Read about the previous manifestations in the Old Testament, Jesus appearing manifested in a physical body, physical body at various times. This is not a theophany, a Christophany, of whatever you want. No, it's not God, maybe Jesus, maybe both. We don't know, two of them, it was both. No, 
It's God Almighty appearing in the Old Testament. Read, come meet my kinsman redeemer. In our study one morning, we spent days, weeks on this. It came to, we came to realize that, and we must be said here, there will undoubtedly be a tremendous amount of pushback and backlash from non-Bible reading, low-informed, ill-informed Christians who cling to their beloved pastor's false teaching and then they'll parrot that Jesus Christ was human. Here's the scriptures, the most revered. They'll throw 1 John 4, 2, 3 at us. About there again, if you confess that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh, then guess what? You can't be of God. You're the Antichrist. This does not say that in the flesh means human flesh. What this does say is the flesh. The is a definite article meaning only one flesh. What could that be, only one flesh? Why doesn't scripture say that he came in the flesh of man? Why doesn't it say he came in flesh? Why do they use the flesh? And why does it say who, what this flesh is, is of God? You say, oh, this means you're God if you confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Let me say this again. To be of God and the spirit of God, which matches his word, we must confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh flesh and there's only one flesh by scripture it's not human flesh but colossians 1 18 tells us what flesh colossians chapter 1 22 and 23 tells us what flesh colossians chapter 2 verses 11 through 13 tells us what flesh just for a moment look at this scripture look at colossians chapter 2 11 through 13 it says right here that in whom all also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, uh, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. What? Uncircumcision of your flesh? Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean my flesh is different from the flesh of Jesus? Yeah. We're dead in sin because of our flesh. But watch. We're quickened together with him having forgiven you full trespasses. Our flesh is not his flesh. Look at Matthew chapter 9, 17. Read Matthew 9. Let's go there together. I, I fear often, we talk about this often, when we just give you scripture to read and go study yourself, often people, because of the lazy nature of human nature, we won't actually go read it for ourselves. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, out the bottles break, and wine runneth out, and bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. We have to have, we cannot be born spiritually into Christ when we are in our old flesh. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1. Read it for yourself. Read, go there with me, flip through, you'll find it. <clears throat> Let's see, I'm going to find it. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express, express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he 
had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ is not sitting at the right hand of the Father, as the Trinitarians teach, and the only the King James says on. Literally, if you want to you take this and saying that Jesus is sitting down on, oh, Jesus is sitting on top of the right hand of the Father. That's why you know it's not two people. It's only one person. On the right hand is the metaphor of saying all power and authority is given to him. And it's his glory, the expressed image of his person. He is separate. He is a part. He came as God, and we have to be born into that. And all the sins of humanity were placed on him as God, the <clears throat> correction all the sins of humanity had to be placed upon him as the son of god <clears throat> in the entire chapter of uh, uh <clears throat> excuse me the entire chapter of first john chapter 4 in all this context it is most clear that we are commanded to understand and believe what God said that in the flesh means God with us. All in the flesh means is God with us. Him himself is with us in persona, not as we are born in the first Adam. Please, again, the spirit is just pressed upon my heart. Stop. Go to 1 John now. Just go read 1 John, the epistles of John. The epistles of John in the back towards Revelation, not the Gospel of John. <clears throat> and um, read 1 John chapter 4. It's interesting. It opens, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. People, that's telling us, if you do not believe that God Almighty was standing before us as, as the only person, the image of the visible image of God, then you're not of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus is come, and we already told you is come, meaning he's standing before us. He's come through the womb as God eternal. Is not of God. That's why so many religions fail to comprehend. They will not understand that Jesus Christ is God Almighty standing before us. That's why the Pharisees had Jesus killed. But reading the entire chapter 4, year of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than is in the world. Greater is he, that's Jesus Christ, God Almighty, is within us. The world speaks like the world, but we're of God. We know that God hears us. He that is not of God heareth not us, whereby know ye the spirit of truth. Beloved, let us love one another for love of God. For love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God, but that loveth not knoweth not God. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. This <clears throat> harmonizes perfectly with John 3.16. His only begotten son means only God himself came through. God himself came through the birth canal. What? What did you say? Yes, God himself, God Almighty, who is before time, the Ancient of Days, came through the birth canal of the virgin from her womb. Herein is love not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son 
to be the propitiation for our sins. Here it is, 1 John 4.10. God himself came through the birth canal to have the sins of uh, taken on our sins, putting on him so that we may stand before him as blameless. That is our justification. That's our that is the grace of our salvation. Look at verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time. That's right. You can't see God the Father. He's spirit. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. What? What does that mean? God, if God is Jesus Christ, God, Jesus Christ doesn't dwell in us. Yes, he does. Read Ephesians. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. What did we read in Isaiah? Let's go back up there real quick to Isaiah. Let's go back to Isaiah. <clears throat> what does it say here in Isaiah? What is it telling us? Let's read it again. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 43, verse 11. Now read 1 John chapter 4. Uh, uh, verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Wait a minute. It says here, that God says, I am the Lord. There's no one beside me. There is no Savior beside me. The Father sent the Son. What does that mean? That means that the Father is the Son in flesh standing before us. Not our flesh, His flesh that He manifested so we can He could be fashioned as we are to be what? Resemble us. And just read for yourself, continue reading chapter 4 for, in 1 John, all the way down. <clears throat> okay, continuing. So we know that form, fashion, Likeness, to be made like unto, literally means to resemble us. We must understand that human flesh, being born of the first Adam to sin, is not God bringing himself through. God is with us. Why is it so easy for Christians to readily believe Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus created everything, and yet they cannot fathom how God would bring himself through the womb? Not the ovum, but the womb of Mary. We are made in his image. This is so easily to set aside and be forgotten, which makes it a lot easier for man to see himself as a little God. Brother Whitaker brought up a very important point. These false teachers like these uh, Kenneth Copelands and this Creflo Dollar and that Rod Parsley and uh, I mean, they're all, you know, the Joyce Myers, all these filthy, rotten, disgusting reprobates. These filthy reprobates, Cretans, Cretans they are. They're teaching, we're little gods, we're little gods. You could see why they would get this. Since we are made in his image, how or why would it make any sense for God to come in human flesh and not his own DNA? God states in Genesis, every creature will come after their own kind. So Jesus, you're just like me. You're my kinsman redeemer. You're like me. You're born to sin. You know sin just like me. Like that confused lad, uh, Watchman uh, 88, years back, he's teaching uh, that Jesus Christ, when the man shooting heroin, 
he's really shooting it in Jesus' arm. Jesus is with you, taking that heroin with you. Jesus is just like you as that uh, Bentley, what's his name? Todd Bentley, Todd, uh, uh, that disgustingly deranged, foul creature. Uh, Todd Bentley, what's his name that has the dreadlocks? He's saying, uh, Jesus is with you, uh, watching porn with you. Uh, he's just you. He's you. God forbid you blasphemers, you blasphemers, repent. Todd White, that's his name. Okay, if you believe that God created man from dust, how could Jesus even remotely have the same flesh as man or even 50%? Meaning Mary's DNA, Mary's ovum, her egg used... The, the ovum is where the DNA comes from, okay, from the female y, y chromosome, I told you. This would make Jesus 100% natural, born into sin. How can God never exist until he was born of the virgin? Think about it. Ask yourself this. If you're not asking yourself these questions, then you need to wake up. If you don't want to wake up, go back to sleep. The only way that this false teaching that Jesus never existed before the virgin birth could exist is one must believe in the Trinity. The YouTuber that I just picked out of one of thousands, tens of thousands, they're speaking the same words that Tertullian used and his great mentor Philo, the Gnostics of Alexandria, who stood for and worshipped pagan gods, yet calling themselves devout followers of Jesus Christ. All through, and I should say all through and after <clears throat> thorough study with Brother Ricky and Sister Lena Whitaker, it became clear that Scripture in the King James Bible does, does not, absolutely does not support anywhere that Jesus Christ was a human being. Of course, if you're foolishly reading a perverted Bible like the NIV, it clearly states that Jesus was fully human. The King James Bible does not read and compare. Let's do it. We found there to be substantial evidence that God's word dispute the facts. We are made in his image. Okay, we're going through this again. We're not squawking Jesus is fully human, but knew no sin. That's not in scripture. And again, we're saying this is what scripture says. He was formed in the fashion as a man. We're repeating, and I'm glad we're repeating. People need to get this over and over until they understand it. Jesus, as a human, was born into sin, or he became sin. Well, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who know no sin. As far as saying Jesus became sin goes, this is far from what is written. It's as far as you can get, and it's utter blasphemy. In vocabulary 101, to become literally means to be, to exist as, in the context to exist as sin. Did you get that? When false teachers say that Jesus became sin for us, that means literally he exists as sin. I'll say it again. When false teachers say that Jesus became sin, they're telling you that Jesus exists as sin. Do you want me to repeat that again? That's not the truth. That's not all what the King James says. That's what the false teachers say. And that completely throws out atonement. Jesus was not sin. He took ownership of it because it was placed on him. He became the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. This harmonizes with Leviticus 16 and Exodus 12. And Jesus Christ personally became the sacrifice. This harmonizes with 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins. That means he is the sacrifice. He takes the sin. 
he's not born into sin. He didn't become, he is not sin and become sin as being the existence of sin. 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins and his body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live righteousness, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 6, And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians, For he hath made him to be sin for us who know no sin. Now, false teachers, they try, they use the incorrect, incorrect translation for the verb to make as become or becoming. But in the context, the word to make in the past participle of made in the English Oxford Dictionary, page 1700, means to impose, to impute, to imp impose, impute means God, the Father, or the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, placed these sins of the world on Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. I'll say it again placed these sins, imposed these charges. And when you look at the word impose to impute, it's a legal term. It's used in case law, and it means a lawful to, to perform the act of literally placing the charges on. This harmonizes perfectly with Isaiah 53, 6. Yes, 2 Corinthians 5.21 harmonizes perfectly with Isaiah 53.6. The Lord hath laid upon him the sins. It means he performed the act to impose, impute this. Scripture with scripture. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. Goes with Isaiah 43. Read Matt. I don't have the time to do this. Please do it yourself. Read Matthew 4.19 with Luke 5.10. Read Matthew 5.36. Read Matthew 12.33. Read Matthew 20.12. Read 21 verse 13 with Isaiah 56 verse 7. And Matthew chapter 22. The hard evidence, folks, is found in Romans chapter 4, specifically verse 8. We've, we've done our homework. We've studied this. We've read these scriptures. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. The verb impute is synonymous with imposed, purposed, which is the contextual meaning of to make, made in the past participle. So let's go back. For he hath made him to be sin, saying, for God is, the Father, the Spirit of Jesus Christ in him, imputed, placed on him, laid upon him the sin for us. Question. Where did we get the phrase, Jesus became sin who know no sin? It doesn't say this here. Where does it say Jesus became sin who knew no sin? No. Sin was laid on him. Sin was laid on him. To become sin means he exists as sin. He did not exist as sin. It was placed on him. Who know no sin. You know where this comes from? The false Bible translations. And then Chris Tomlin's song lyrics. Listen to this song. He starts singing. Um, G Chris Tomlin literally. In one of his songs, Brother Ricky found this they literally start to sing the lyrics and the lyrics where it became sin who knew no sin. And we repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Our ears are tickled. We clap and tap along with the devil's entertainment system. We tap and sing the mantras of the twisted words that are not aligned with true scripture. We often find this in the pop culture of the so-called Christian music world where these performers are dressed in very, very gay, very effeminate clothing. The men are very effeminate. Because why? Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads into life and few there be that find it. 
these mantras they sing repeat repeat mantra hinduism buddhism repeated to aid concentration into meditation unlearn non-bible reading and especially non-king james bible reading sinos christian in name only they go around in woeful ignorance parroting that jesus became sin additionally we find perverted translations they change the syntax of the words to completely pervert let's do some examples i keep saying we don't have a let, let's do this compare second do this for yourself Compare 2 Corinthians chapter 521, the King James with the NIV. Watch this. God made him who had no sin to be sin. I'm not kidding you. Read it. Read it. God made him who had no sin to be sin. That's not what the King James says. The King James, we already said, made him to be sin for us. Made who had no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become righteous. God, okay. The NIV is literally saying in the full syntax analysis that God created Jesus Christ with no sin and then made him to exist as sin. Hell, blasphemy. And, 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 and it's not only the NIV. Look at the NASB. Look at the ESV. We break it down here later. Let's talk about in the flesh. Defining the human, the word human is provided further in the study. And this study will surely offend many. We know ones and twos out there are going to come out. Here are scriptures about those who were offended when Jesus left. Look carefully at why they were offended by a so-called human claiming to be God. Read carefully John chapter 6, 41 through 45 and 61 through 64. And the Jews then murmured it, mum <clears throat> murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They said, hey, whoa, 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 wait a minute. So they said, wait a minute. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Before Jesus answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourself. No man can come to me except the father which hath sent me. Draw him and I raise him up on last days. It is written by the, in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, come unto me. Many, therefore, disciples, when they heard this, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can bear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? And what? What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning that they were that not believed not, and who should betray him. And then it goes down here, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. We read in John 12, 40, for more on how God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart. When we were in the midst of this study, sister, the, the Spirit of God moved mightily on Sister Lena and Rika. We were praying and, and, and re studying this, please take the time. Listen to Sister Lena's audio clip on this. I was deeply moved. It's in the link here. S Sister Lena's audio clip. Back on, he has made him to be sin for us in 2 Corinthians 5.21. In the Old Testament, the sacrifice for the sins of the people was not a 
<clears throat> correction was only a very temporary atonement. An animal takes the place of you, for you, and I as a representation of us. Laying on the altar in our stead and paying the penalty for the short temporary time. For all the things that we have and have not done concerning the law of God. It has to be repeated over and over. This is a temporary fix. Can you imagine the amount of blood that would continually flow? But we see when standing below the cross of Christ in the view of this particular angle, significantly different when it comes to the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God. When you look up from the foot of the cross in acceptance of his sacrifice, his blood shall wash you clean. Your blood-stained robes will be washed white as snow. This is the only place you'll be able to find the mercy you seek. And it is forgive his forgiveness that your heart shall desire. And both of these desires will be fulfilled when we but come unto him. What does it mean to come to him? It means to come with understanding. It is written to know wisdom is to fear God and know the fear of God is to no longer have to fear death. To come with an understanding that God is Jesus Christ. The one, the same, period, the beginning, middle, and end of the story. He always was and is and evermore shall be. Amen. Can you see in this statement the me, myself, and I? It is, in fact, he whom we know to be God. This clause is, uh, this clause in the objective case. And in the same manner of speech as let us make man in our image. And we see it in the Psalms where David cried vexed in the same objective pronoun. J. David was vexed to his core, his soul, his spirit, and his body. Us, same as me, myself, and I. In 2 Samuel 24, 14, and David said to God, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. And so in Genesis chapter 1, 26, we see the same objective clauses used. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The statement written by Moses in Genesis is at the time which was when the final climactic act of creation was done and God made that announcement. This, us, and our signifies his majestic power over all creation. To see this statement as being facts points to, uh, as being facts pointing to three persons and one Godhead may be implicitly seen at best. And there are more scriptures than I can count that do contradict the Trinity notion absolutely and leaving you without a doubt as to who God truly is, that he is one God, not two or three in one. Take into consideration the author and audience of those days of old. They were told to worship the Lord thy God and him only, only one God, only one, one personality with only one body, which he made manifest and visible to us, Jesus Christ, Lord of all, Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. Just because some of mankind still believe that they get to choose and they can decidedly invent who God is to them does not make it so. These shall find that the God they decide on did not even come close to who he is. And their belief did not make God so. That ridiculous thought when drawn out of its logical conclusion can only be just that plainly this notion is ridiculous and ludicrous and they called Jesus a lunatic. 
God is not who you or I decide he is. He is I am. This is scriptural. But this means we must read the scriptures to know. We must take God's word in context or he will not or we will not understand him. And why would anyone fear what they don't believe or even remotely understand? This leads us to the next two-part question. Who does one choose not to believe if one doesn't understand? How can one make a decision without knowing or understanding the consequences? Yet people do it every day. Read Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32. Take the time, make the time to read that. And every day, this final decision is made and confirmed over and over again with every breath we take. Because there's only two choices, people. Who he is and who he is not. It's a simple yes or no question. Do you believe him or your own vain imagination and image of him? And the last question to ask yourself all day long and when closing one's eyes to sleep each day, do I fear God? Search your heart now before you stop reading. Lord, please open the scriptures to all who will receive your word. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Dear listener, we're going to stop here, right here, and make this part one of the two parts of this video. We ask before we close that you really do literally stop and search your heart now before you stop reading. If you haven't already stopped reading and thrown this aside. We are at a crossroads, the fork in the road that Jesus puts us there every day. It's a decision of choice between right and wrong. You do not want to be left in too much exposure to bad habits of others, bad influences from peers, so-called brethren, pastors, teachers. We either run after philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, or after Christ. After Christ is to honor and obey God's word to be of good influence on others. Holding up a standard of right and wrong, not becoming subversive. Subversive, subversive while standing on the wrong side of the road at the crossroads. This is where we pick up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Now tomorrow, I'm going to open up the second part of the study, we keep saying, this is why people are saying human, human, because false teachers say that human form of Jesus, 100% human, fully human. This is where they're getting it. Okay. This is the NIV Hebrews chapter two, verse 17. For this reason, he had to be made like them fully human in every way. Look at what it says down lower and that he might might make atonement. Yeah, okay. And then we'll pick this up tomorrow. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. May eyes be open. Even so, come soon, Lord Jesus. Until that time, strengthen us in your might to walk according to your will, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Even so, come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Maranatha.